Hello everyone, this is Nick Oswald welcoming you to this Bite Size BioWeb seminar. Today's presentation is titled Metagenomics and Type 1 Diabetes Application to the TEDI, that's the Environmental Determinants of Diabetes in the Young study, and it's been presented by Joseph Petrosino, PhD. Joseph was hired as a tenure track a faculty member at the Baylor College of Medicine in 2006 and as a large-scale sequencing center principal investigator for the HMP, Dr. Petrosino led consortium efforts for standardized clinical uh, sample preparation, sequencing, and analysis. And this allowed microbial communities from diverse body sites and niches to be compared with minimal technical bi bias. Dr. Petrosino is director of the ArcTech Center for Metagenomics and Metabiome Research, which is pursuing over 100 metagenomics products that tag target the improvement of human health through detection and modulation of the microbes that reside in and on us. We are also joined by Suzanne Kennedy. Suzanne is the Director of Research and Development at Mobile and is also a long-standing contributor of excellent articles to Bite Size Bio. So first we'll hand over to Suzanne who will give us a, a short introduction. Thank you. And uh, Mobile Labs would like to thank Bite Size Bio and their staff for organizing the seminar today and for the opportunity to host uh, the Dr. Joseph Petrosino and to share with everyone the exciting work going on in his lab. Before we begin, I have just a few slides to tell you a little bit about Mobile Labs and how we became involved in projects like the Teddy Project. So first, a little bit about Mobile. We are getting ready to celebrate 20 years of business this coming August and we are privately owned by our founders, Mark and Liz Berlaski. We enjoy the benefits of being a small company with only 40 employees. This gives us the flexibility and the speed to develop custom solutions and give personalized help to research labs all over the world. Our distribution network extends to 83 countries and our focus area is the isolation of DNA and RNA from difficult samples. So what are difficult samples, and how do we define difficult? Let's take a look at some of the different sample types people work with, and if we plot them based on how difficult they are to lyse versus how inhibitor-rich they are, we can see that there is a subset of samples that are the most difficult, and these are environmental. And these can be from the human stool or gut or from the great outdoors but the stool samples are the subject of today's presentation on type 1 diabetes. Now where do these inhibitors come from? They are released during cell lysis, which is the first step in DNA and RNA isolation. We use bee beating or mechanical lysis to break open microbes and release the DNA, since this is the best way to get the most lysis with the least amount of bias. But in this process of bee beating, inhibitors from the sample are released. And in stool, this would include compounds such as bile, bilirubin, heme from dead red blood cells, and it can also involve undigested food, since diet plays a major role in the contents of the gut. And this is where inhibitor removal technology, or IRT, comes in. IRT is used to remove those inhibitory compounds before the isolation of nucleic acids, so that purification results in high quality DNA and RNA. And this is a patented process that is utilized in all of the power kits by Mobile. Now I'd like to give you a little idea of just how important it is to remove these impurities and give you an example of how it impacts your perceived DNA yields. So let's take a look at an example of two samples prepped, one with and without IRT. And nanodrop data is what most people look at first. So here we have some data. And if we focus on yields only, as shown by the red arrows, when inhibitors are present, it appears as if these samples have higher DNA yields. But if we look across at the purity readings, we see some problems. The combination of a low 260-230 ratio with a high 340 reading tells us this contaminant is not just salt. It's compounds from the sample. If it were just salt, we'd see only a low 260 to 30 ratio. The nanodrop allows us to look at plot data as well so that we can look at absorbance across the wavelengths. And we see here clearly that the inhibitors are causing amplified absorbance across the entire range of wavelengths. 
including the 260. Well, to confirm Nanodrop data, we always run an agarose gel. It allows us to check the integrity of our sample and also make sure that the Nanodrop data correlates with how the DNA looks visually. So here you can take a look at these same DNAs and you can see that, in fact, the samples prepped with IRT have higher DNA yields than the samples prepped without. We do see some degraded RNA in the sample. You can see that right here. And this, too, is going to contribute to that false amplification of the 260 reading, resulting in a perceived higher yield. So going into your next experiment, if your input DNA, your input DNA is not going to be accurate if you have DNA containing inhibitors. This will lead to inconsistencies in the data going forward and problems with accuracy later on when you're trying to interpret results. This next slide demonstrates how inhibitors impact qPCR or real-time PCR. In this experiment here performed by Brandon Eicher at the University of Arizona, they needed a way to detect viruses from wastewater and biosolids and were having a difficult time getting consistent detection of spiked virus. The control is here shown by the red arrow and detection as close as possible to this line equals 100% recovery of spiked virus. The viruses analyzed are adenovirus, which is a DNA virus, murine neurovirus, poliovirus, a human enterovirus, and MS2 as a control phage. Using IRT, okay, using IRT, they were able to finally detect all four viruses with high efficiency, close to 100% recovery. I only have one other experiment to show you, and that also comes from a scientist at McGill University, Carolyn Vincent. Here they used a fecal sample collected from a dog, and in their case, they filtered the samples to remove undigested food. The RNA was purified with the power microbiome kit and sequenced on the Illumina HiSeq platform. A genomic DNA sample was also sequenced to be used as a reference to align a random subset of 500 RNA transcripts using 90% identity and 90% coverage threshold. The results demonstrated that the mRNA reads closely aligned to predicted gene regions along the DNA contig and variations in gene expression levels could be inferred from the depth of coverage. Now the Power Microbiome Kit is available in a high-throughput, 96-well, magnetic bead format called the PowerMag Microbiome Kit. This uses a novel magnetic bead technology called ClearMag to perform the purification of DNA and RNA on robotic workstations. This kit was actually originally developed for the TEDDY project to help them achieve the difficult task of high-throughput RNA isolation from stool and is currently being run on the Eppendorf EB Motion 5075 TMX robot. Well, this leads me to your featured speaker, Dr. Joseph Petrosino from Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. Petrosino, as you've heard, is the director of the Alkex Center for Metagenomics and Microbiome Research. And through this center, they are pursuing over 100 different metagenomics projects involving human health and microbiology. Mobile is very excited to be part of this important research and type 1 diabetes that is sure to lead to many breakthroughs. And with that, I am going to transfer controls over to our speaker. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be able to speak to this group. Um, I appreciate your interest and hope, hope I can address many of the questions surrounding um, our work here, not only in the center, but specifically for the Teddy Project. Um, I, I realize that this audience will be broad-based, and so I'm hoping to address many of the topics in a way that will hopefully grasp um, many different audiences. And, uh, and of course, at the end, there will be time for questions too, I believe. Um, and if, if not, you can always uh, send me emails uh, later as well. So I, I start uh, with my metagenomics talks with, a, uh, with what I think is a really beautiful slide uh, uh, created um, from a paper by Valm et al. and PNAS of last year in Gary Boriski's lab at uh, Woods Hole. Um, these are fluorescently labeled uh, 
microbiota from the oral cavity. These are 15 different taxa using in situ hybridization to 16S genes. And I use this as sort of an introduction to remind people that we're not alone. Not everybody are micro, not everybody in our audiences are microbiologists and and um, and I think an appreciation for the fact that these are organisms that are growing and living with us and have been evolving with us for thousands and thousands of years. Before I go further, um, I typically introduce a glossary to try to get us on at least somewhat of a, a similar uh, page uh, for those who aren't familiar with metagenomics of the microbiome. Um, and so the microbiome I consider and I think is generally broadly considered is the entire collection of bacteria, viruses, and fungi and other single cell eukaryotes that occupy various niches on or in a given environment. The human microbiome therefore is, is the uh, collection of micro microbiota that naturally occupy the niches, niches on or in the human body. And then metagenomics is really the key to why we're, why we're here and why this field has really uh, exploded in the last several years. Metagenomics pertains to the use of modern technologies to study these communities of microbes uh, directly in their natural environments without having to grow them or, or, or isolate them prior to study. And so if you consider the fact that the majority of organisms that grow uh, within our digestive tract are unable to be grown in a laboratory using standard practices, um, there really needed to be a breakthrough in technology to be able to see just who is there and, and their relative abundance. And so the same technologies that brought us the human genome are being used now uh, to take, essentially take a, a census of organisms from very diverse niches on our bodies and in the environment. Um, likewise, the human virome is of particular interest with respect to the Teddy project um, and, and other projects that we pursue, and that is the collection of eukaryotic viruses and, and bacteriophages that also exist in the body. And they, ha they can sometimes have a direct impact on the bacterial communities we may be interested in. They definitely have an impact on the human host itself. And um, as such, because of the unique nature, we have a separate pipeline to handle viral metagenomics, and that is the application of genetic appro genomic approaches um, to capture the viral diversity in a given niche without having to propagate the viruses themselves. So, again, some of you may not not be up to speed on the human microbiome and why is it why is it of interest? Uh, the cocktail party fact. That I start with is the fact that bacterial cells outnumber human cells by at least a factor of 10. That is, we are more bacterial than we are human, just by cell count. And that the genes encoded by those organisms outnumber the genes in the human genome by at least a factor of 400. And the more we're learning, uh, that number is increasing. Um, we know that the microbiome includes pathogens, prevents, us, uh, prevents infectious diseases through uh, several mechanisms, one of which is through blocking um, the niches that pathogens would like to occupy. Uh, I sometimes refer to that as the good neighbor hypothesis. We, we love living in neighborhoods that are full of people that we consider our friends and, and uh, have block parties or apartment building gatherings and whatnot. But as soon as people move out, uh, there's a chance for bad elements to move in. And that's what happens in the digestive tract with infections such as uh, Clostridium difficile. Um, so the bacteria under normal good symbiotic uh, 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 levels uh, protects against uh, pathogens from moving in. Likewise, the skin microbiome uh, actually feeds on the secretions uh, that, that we produce and creates a film that prevents cracks uh, and, and invasion portals for pathogens to enter the body. I should preface the, going, before going further that microbiome talks are always great right after or before lunches or dinners. Um, it, it only gets better. Um, and then more importantly, I think in the, uh, with relevance to many of the projects that are being pursued by many laboratories today, we're getting a better appreciation for how the microbiome impacts the immune response. Um, we know through the study of germ-free animals uh, that without the microbiome, we, we need it to establish a, uh, a full maturation of the immune response. That is, we need bacteria to, to build our immunity. Uh, we Germ-free mice, that is mice that are grown without my, uh, the presence of microbiota on or in them, do not develop significant levels of IgA, which is the most abundant immunoglobulin found in, digest, in our digestive tract. Likewise, they form abnormally large numbers of 
inflammatory cells and display symptoms characteristic of IBS and asthma. Um, included on this slide are, are some schematics about how the microbiome impacts the uh, other, other processes such as brain function. They produce short-chain fatty acids and molecules such as GABA that can cross the blood-brain barrier and impact synapse, um, uh, synapse firing and, and receptors in the brain. Um, and there are many other factors too that the microbiome uh, helps provide uh, to human, human development. So logically therefore as we begin to understand how the microbiome in healthy individuals differs from those in people with different diseases we hope to be able to identify organisms or genes associated with health and disease that can both lead to new probiotics, probiotics that are designed to help with certain uh, disease, uh, impact certain diseases, as well as diagnostics. And I think diagnostics actually may be one of the first things that fall out from human microbiome studies. That is, detection of, of organisms and or genes, functions, that aren't normal for uh, people uh, under, under health, state of health, uh, and therefore may actually serve to um, portend diseases that may be uh, coming. Um, and likewise, so with these mechanisms, hopefully we can have a, a positive impact on human health. So for every microbiome talk or metagenomic talk that you'll hear, this is traditionally the approach that uh, the study design that people are using. And so I thought I'd briefly walk through it here. Um, starting at the top left, um, we collect samples from your favorite environmental or body orifice. Uh, enrich for the bacteria, viruses, or eukaryotes that are present based on what, the, what type of study you're pursuing. Extract nucleic acids using um, a variety of methods, and Suzanne covered uh, beautifully some of the uh, products that we use to, to do so with the studies that we, we pursue. And then, depending on the resources and, again, the, the target of the study, we will uh, do a, a broad-based uh, approach looking at the micro, use a broad based approach looking at the uh, microbiota there through 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing. And so, bacteria have the bacterial 16S ribosomal RNA gene uh, is unique to bacteria, is able to be targeted, as I'll talk about in a moment, uh, in a way using PCR primers so that you can amplify uh, portions of the gene. Uh, that lead to its the identification of the organism that the gene is encoded by. And through this, you can get start to build community structure uh, maps and, and lists and uh, get the relative abundance of organisms that are present. Um, this, is, this enables a comparison of every single sample in a given study and, and then starts to give you some resolution as to the differences maybe that you can find between, for example, healthy and um, sick individuals. Likewise, you could stratify on any criteria that you're, you're gathering uh, as part of your metadata for a given study. What we then do uh, is perform whole genome shotgun sequencing, or WGS, on some of the samples. Since it's a more expensive procedure, most studies aren't able to encompass whole genome shotgun sequencing at the moment for, for uh, all samples. And the whole genome shotgun sequencing enables even deeper analysis of the communities, communities that are present. Uh, one of the types of analyses that gives you is the pan genome, or be able to, or a map of the collect, or a list of the collection of genes found uh, in a particular sample, all of the genes, uh, or nearly all of them. Um, it enables finer resolution of the description of the taxa that are present in a given sample. It allows you to look for antibiotic resistance genes in a given sample if that's uh, your area of interest. Um, and likewise, it enables you to mine. Um, pretty much any gene function or family that you're expecting or looking for in a particular uh, to sample type. Um, go further. So looking at the 16S ribosomal RNA uh, a little bit more in detail, this is a cartoon schematic of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. It's about 1,600 bases long. Most uh, or most organisms, if not all of them, contain at least uh, more than one 16S ribosomal RNA gene. These are um, can almost be thought of as a large immunoglobulin gene for those that are immunologists in the fact that they have variable regions here highlighted in blue that are flanked by conserved domains highlighted in black. And through targeting the conserved regions with PCR primers uh, that, are, that have degeneracy built into them, um, you can target most of the taxa that you are interested in in a given sample. I say most because there are some sequences that diverge in some organisms, and that has to be taken into consideration when you're looking at 
uh, a particular sample. You want to make sure that if you're interested, for example, in clostridium in a particular sample, that the primers here are indicated by arrows, that they actually contain sequences that would pick up the clostridial 16S ribosome RNA gene. Because of the sequencing uh, technology that we use, we cannot sequence the entire 16S ribosome RNA gene to the depth that we wish. We're going to look at thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of sequences per sample. We can target, however, windows of a couple hundred bases to several hundred bases. Um, and therefore, we look at a subset of the variable regions in a given 16S gene. Those variable regions uh, evolve at a faster rate than the um, uh, conserved domains and therefore have variability that can then be used to associate the gene sequence with the organism it came from. Um, we use ribosomal databases, uh, either green genes or um, the ribosomal database project, uh, RNA uh, database, to map sequences back to ribosomal RNA genes to be able to identify who they came from. I'm not going to go too much into next generation sequencing technologies because there are many people, maybe on this call perhaps, that could describe these technologies much in much greater detail. But um, for the start of the Human Microbiome Project, we had just moved our technologies over from Sanger, traditional Sanger sequencing, which could give up to a thousand bases, uh, thousand base reads. Uh, however, only at a hundred or three hundred at a time. Um, to the 454 platform, which is what has been used now uh, predominantly for 16S sequencing for the last five or six years, um, the 454 platform gives uh, from Roche gives approximately 300 to 500 base reads, now up to 700 base reads before trimming, and leads to gives you uh, over a million reads per run, um, and this enables you to look at several hundred samples at a time through multiplexing. Likewise, we are now moving uh, to the Illumina. Uh, platforms for 16S sequencing, either the HiSeq platform or the MySeq platform, where the reads are a bit shorter, uh, however you can get much deeper into a sample, uh, allowing for a, a better snapshot of the uh, organisms that may be at the least abundant levels in your particular project. And this schematic uh, kind of gives you a comparison of the sequencing technologies and their relative read lengths, and, and, and the reason why read length is important is because it uh, obviously allows for, uh, the, or it dictates how much of the 16S sequence you're capturing in a particular read. Um, and so 500 bases as a reference on the bottom of this figure, you can see which sequencing platforms are able to span such a domain and how many of those would require uh, paired end sequencing to be able to do so. There are pipelines available to sequence and analyze samples uh, using all the technologies, including Ironpoint, which I've added now as sort of our, our latest uh, development pipeline. Um, and depending on the project, we are able to target one of these platforms uh, for our needs. So to kind of give you a reference of who we are, um, we exist in the Texas Medical Center here at Baylor College of Medicine. We're sort of central in the foreground of the picture uh, that's, that's here. It's the largest medical center in the world. Uh, the city of Houston is the main downtown district is in the background and the medical center is in the foreground. So you can see that it's made up of a highly complex community of, uh, of both research institutions and hospitals. But to me, uh, what I think of when I see this is the fact that there are millions of samples that could be exploited for metagenomic studies. Um, you literally can't walk down the hallway without tripping over a clinician and that's actually a good thing. Um, what's scary though is that each of the clinicians seems to have a freezer full of stool, and um, and, and so they and they and fortunately they want to share it with us uh, because I think there are a lot of great clinical studies that have been performed over the years where people have had the foresight to collect samples uh, to be able to use for a variety of analyses, and now as we as they move forward we're getting prospectively uh, contacted to be able to to include metagenomics as part of the study design, which makes for even better better studies. And as such, we're fortunate to have Baylor College of Medicine um, fund uh, through philanthropy and uh, institutional backing the Alcock Center for Metagenomics and Microbiome Research. Um, and our mission here is to understand how the microbi microbiome impacts health and disease and to translate this into better therapeutics, therapeutics and diagnostics and to serve as a hub for these activities. Um, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, we have over 100 projects right now with over 70 collaborators from around the world. Um, we're advancing the sequencing, culturing, and analysis technologies to be able to encompass the new and diverse projects that we 
uh, continuously are introduced to each week. Um, we have pilot funds that we provide to researchers in the Texas Medical Center to help start studies when people may have an idea but not necessarily the know-how or wherewithal to be able to do so. Um, and we're developing better ties with clinicians so that we can actually enhance our study designs as well as the potential impact. Um, we're not stopping at the microbiome analysis, of, uh, uh, genomic analyses that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's important to, to note that we understand as well as many researchers in this field that identifying the differences in the bacteria and the genes present in the given sample is just the beginning in that um, it provides clues that need to be tested in, in hypothesis-driven models. And as such, uh, we're developing uh, germ-free facilities and other uh, animal systems to be able to do hypothesis-driven studies in the microbiome. And we're also recruiting. for So for anybody who's at the postdoc level, um, we're, we're hiring tenure-track faculty to work on the microbiome here uh, at Baylor College of Medicine. So this, this figure sort of highlights some of the communities that we study and the institutions that we work with. Uh, we have projects everywhere from Kazakhstan to Colombia um, in South America. Uh, about two-thirds of our projects are centered here in the Texas Medical Center and one-third are, are from, from outside the Texas Medical Center. And we're not restricted to humans. Uh, we, we work with any samples, including those from mice, and that's uh, mouse is our most prevalent animal model that we work in the microbiome with, and we have a number of great collaborators uh, on that front as well. The studies we have impact a number of different disease uh, diseases, um, whereas the talk title suggests we're going to focus a little bit on a project we're starting just now on type 1 diabetes, uh, working with uh, Jeff Krischer at the University of South Florida. However, you can see that we, 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 we show no favorites. Um, we're very interested in, in a variety of uh, diseases and, um, and models for disease. Uh, and in addition, we're also looking at the microbiome then after death and, the, and the de in decomposition as a potential forensic. And we also have a couple of samples from mummy, or a couple sets of samples from Renaissance era mummies that are of particular interest that I could talk about at a future time if people are interested. Um, so specifically with respect to our diabetes studies, um, uh, this slide I was graciously given um, uh, by Kendra Vick at uh, University of South Florida, who's uh, working with the Teddy group, and uh, she provided some, some great slides to help me with my intro for Teddy. So for type 1 diabetes, who people who aren't familiar, it's an autoimmune disease of the pancreas. Um, and the uh, general paradigm that's accepted today is that there's a genetic susceptibility um, that leads to autoimmunity that can be detected in the presence of antibodies, one of uh, up to three uh, autoantibodies uh, that lead to degeneration of the beta cells in the pancreas. And the thing is, is that genetic dis susceptibility alone does not describe the onset, does not well enough describe the onset of disease. And there appears to be environmental factors involved. And um, and at two levels, in the fact that we have what are called initiators, be it um, obesity or diet or a virus, or there are many hypotheses as to what these could be that lead to the presence or to the appearance of autoimmune antibodies. Um, but then some people are actually arrest with the appearance of one or two autoimmune antibodies uh, that, and, and don't go further. And that's, that in itself is of interest, and in that the, the um, progression to the final clinical stage of diabetes with all three autoantibodies present um, seems to require a secondary trigger uh, or another component. And so uh, these are referred to as, the, as promoters and the candidates uh, for promoters in type 1 diabetes, uh, the list is as long as it is uh, for the initiators. And so without these exogenous factors, it's thought that we wouldn't naturally progress it, people that are susceptible for diabetes wouldn't actually progress to full onset. The observation, and I don't have time at the moment to show the data, but uh, the, the observation is that the type 1 diabetes is increasing. Um, and it's not thought, it's not known exactly why this is occurring. Um, it's perhaps it's directly related to the uh, exogenous factors that I mentioned in the previous slide. And therefore, one of the hypotheses is that there's a more adverse environment at play. Uh, there's an increasing, maybe perhaps an increasing exposure to viruses that may trigger the autoimmune response. Um, 
there's other hypotheses suggesting that decreasing breastfeeding rates may be uh, impacting this incidence. Um, the hygiene hypothesis comes out in, in a number of uh, disease and health models, and it's, it's also present here in the fact that protective factors that uh, exposures that may actually help boost the immune system or target it properly are now missing in, in, in countries where children are more sheltered or living, living lives indoors more frequently um, or more often and therefore are, are not exposed to organisms that are actually help produce a healthy immune response. Um, there's also a younger age at onset rather than a true increase in lifetime incidence and, and so this leads to the uh, another hypothesis called the accelerator hypothesis. Uh, oh, I didn't realize there was a so I'll get to that back I'll get back to the accelerator hypothesis in a second. Um, there are a number of infectious agents that are thought to be uh, environmental triggers for type 1 diabetes diabetes and they've been grouped into different tiers based on the data that uh, are associated with type 1 onset. Right now the enteroviruses and and to a slightly lesser extent rotaviruses have been implicated in type 1 diabetes subjects. Um, I'll show you a slide later on showing staining of pancreatic, pancreatic tissue from a type 1 diabetes individual, uh, an individual type 1 diabetes, um, suggesting that the virus may be associated with disease onset. Um, there, there's other pathogens, there's been a number of pathogens uh, with not so bad data um, that uh, have also been implicated in type 1 diabetes and because of the fact that of these, this accumulating data with infectious agents, um, it's from this evidence that uh, the Teddy project, specifically the microbiome component of the Teddy project, uh, was, was built. And so this slide shows the um, one of the evidence, uh, lines of evidence for type 1 enteroviruses and underlying type 1 diabetes, both using uh, RT-PCR uh, and DNA in situ hybridization as well as uh, antibodies targeted for the VP1 protein of enteroviruses in cases, in this case A and C versus controls, which in this case is B, uh, slides B and D, we can actually find uh, examples of where enteroviruses are found uh, near on, in near onset pancreatic tissue um, from type 1 subjects. And this is a little bit out of order, but the accelerator, accelerator hypothesis, that is the hypothesis uh, to explain why um, perhaps there's a younger onset for type 1 diabetes, uh, is that perhaps increasing levels of obesity in children uh, is leading to uh, autoimmune destruction of beta cells through the mechanism of insulin resistance. And so this is another area of study that's being uh, closely followed in the Teddy study, in the Teddy cohort as well as others. So we referred to the Teddy cohort. Um, now what is the Teddy cohort? Um, so as mentioned earlier, Teddy stands for the Environmental Determinants of Diabetes in, in the Young. Uh, it's uh, based out of the University of South Florida and the idea um, with the study is that they wanted to collect data from cohorts of newborns uh, from the general population uh, as well as newborns with first degree relatives with probands with type 1 diabetes. Um, they're present in six uh, clinical centers around the world, uh, actually in Western Europe and the United States, and I'll mention that, go back to that in a moment. These cohorts are going to be followed for 15 years, they're at year 7 right now, uh, for the, the appearance of um, beta cell autoantibodies and diabetes onset. The beauty of the study is not only that is, the, is it that it's prospective, but the amount of data that's being collected with these children, uh, diets, infections, vaccinations, uh, social stressors, um, are just a few uh, of the many, uh, many um, elements that are being collected from these uh, child's li children's lives uh, that could be potentially impactful on disease. And so the goal, uh, therefore, the cohort itself is a recruitment of eight, over 8,000 neonates, and it's over, I believe the number is actually over 8,600 now, from six clinical centers that I mentioned, uh, or we alluded to earlier, um, in Finland, Germany, Sweden, and three in North America, one in Seattle, one in Colorado, and one in uh, Georgia, Florida, uh, the combined institute. Um, and blood sampling, we'll talk about sampling uh, in a moment. But this is, go again, going on for over, uh, for 15 years, and we're at year seven. 
clinical centers I mentioned are, are shown on the left. Uh, their, the choice of clinical centers in part was due to the fact that they had experience in recruiting and studying uh, and building a relationship with, with type 1 diabetes children. Uh, it's funded through multiple centers at NIH and the CDC and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. And the goal, uh, specifically as the name suggests, is to identify environmental factors and gene environment interactions that cause islet uh, autoimmunity and then eventually type 1 diabetes onset. Um, we want to look at diverse populations, therefore the recruitment of individuals both in Europe and the U.S., uh, and as well as in eth different ethnic groups um, with and without first-degree uh, uh, type, uh, first type 1 diabetic relatives. We um, want to look at the immunopathogenesis and then natural history uh, from birth to type 1 diabetes onset, and again, the prospective nature of this study is what makes it so beautiful uh, in terms of sample analysis, uh, sample and data analysis. Um, and there is a central repository that's collecting the biological samples for additional studies that, um, that are being performed at this moment. And so this slide shows a little bit of the uh, sample collection and follow-up visits, um, along with some of the, the uh, studies that are being done with some of the blood. Um, stool samples are collected monthly um, and uh, through type 1 diabetes onset. And so I should mention that with over uh, 8,600 children enrolled, about 5% will actually progress to full onset type 1 diabetes uh, based on what, what are known stati the known statistics. Um, and therefore, uh, case control groups are being uh, um, identified, and it's from these cases and controls that um, samples that we're going to be studying for the microbiome component uh, have derived from. And so right now, there's about 120 125 plus or minus individuals uh, so far that have already gotten type 1 diabetes from the cohort, and it's it's from this group that we're looking at cases and control samples from their cases and controls. And so, the Teddy Viral and Microbial Metagenomic Laboratory, so the, the, you'll see the acronym TBML uh, a little bit later. Uh, will actually represent the largest clinical microbiome project to date that we're aware of, including the HMP, in terms of the samples and data sets that are going to be collected. Uh, the primary goals are to identify viral candidates that may trigger type 1 diabetes, and this will be done using stool and plasma samples from the cases and control subjects that I alluded to a moment ago. We also have some access to PBMC samples from these children that were collected a little bit later in the, in the study, uh, after the study had started. Um, we actually will have a virus-targeted uh, extraction component. So I mentioned before that uh, not only are we going to be collecting viral data from the primary DNA isolated from samples, but we're actually going to be uh, isolating, attempt to isolate viruses from these samples directly um, for sequencing, uh, as well as culturing. And so we actually have an arm I'll talk about in a moment uh, where we're going to attempt to culture viruses that we may be able to rescue from these samples. Um, in case we were able to, that would provide a very valuable resource for future study. We're going to be looking at the association of the microbiome itself with progression to type 1 diabetes, and, and we're going to be doing comprehensive uh, microbiome analyses to, to do this. This will, not, this will entail not only 16S ribosome RNA sequencing that I mentioned earlier, but also 18S. 18S is, uh, 18S is a, it's the fingerprint gene for eukaryotic organisms as well, uh, akin to the 16S gene. Uh, we'll do whole genome shotgun sequencing on every single sample, not just a subset of samples, to be able to get a, a snapshot of the gene content of every sample. And I mentioned before, well, we can be looking at both the RNA and DNA from viruses that are found in stool and plasma. We're uh, also going to identify bio biomarkers associated with type 1 diabetes. As some of you may be thinking right now, well, there should be no bacteria in plasma just based on the way it's collected. But we're also going to be looking at uh, free nucleic acids that may be circulating um, as, as a uh, potential source of biomarkers that could be uh, indicative of, of, uh, of something underlying type 1 onset. Uh, all the data sets will include human DNA and RNA that quote unquote contaminate. For many people doing human genomic studies, uh, that the idea of human DNA being the contaminant is probably a little bit foreign, but for us, uh, this contamination actually can pro provide a source of information as well. Um, and these data will be available uh, according to Teddy and NIH policies 
we collaborate with Rob Knight at the University of Colorado at Boulder, um, and we have other collaborators that will be joining us later in the study as well to help us uh, along, uh, along the lines of getting towards these goals. I'm not going to walk you through the slide in its entirety, but these, this represents the data sets and products that are being generated as part of the Teddy Microbiome um, study. Um, the Human Genome Sequencing Center at Baylor is, is uh, one of the three large-scale sequencing centers funded by NHGRI. Uh, it's, they've been involved uh, in the Human Microbiome Project, and that's where our center finds its roots. Um, and now they are strong collaborators with us on every project that we work on. And so samples are processed here, sequenced in the Human Genome Sequencing Center here at Baylor, and then we perform analyses downstream of, uh, of gathering the sequencing data. And so um, this is, I put this slide in for people who may want to come back to the talk later. Um, the uh, various viral and bacterial and uh, eukaryotic data that will be present uh, or generated from the study are outlined here. So in the, uh, I just want to highlight the, the, what I mean by the data sets being the largest clinical microbiome project to date. We're actually going to be generating, because we're using the HiSeq platform, we're going to be generating about 300,000 reads per sample for every single sample at the 16S and 18S level. We'll be generating a gigabase of whole genome shotgun data for every single sample, and 10% of the samples after primary analysis will have five gigabases of sequence um, generated in addition to, to generate a deeper data set uh, for samples of interest. And to give a, to kind of provide a reference for the Human Microbiome Project, about 10 gigabases of, of data was generated per sample. And of course, in this case, we're looking at 18,000 samples as opposed to 700. There'll be a viral enrichment prep, as I mentioned before. Um, the primary sample will be analyzed and generating 600 megabases for all samples. And then for samples that are cultured, we're going to sequence all of those uh, to a level of 200 megabases. Uh, so we're going to have a primary viral uh, microbiome analysis, and then anything that happens to grow on susceptible cell lines, I'll talk about in a second, will generate um, additional data for those. And so what do I mean by culturing uh, viruses? Essentially, when we create, when we uh, extract samples, we create a homogenate that is then uh, filtered, um, hopefully enriching for the viruses that are present in a given sample. This is passed to our collaborator, Rick Lloyd, in the molecular virology and microbiology department here at Baylor. And he's a long-standing enteroviral specialist, and he has uh, multiple cell lines that are highly susceptible uh, to enteroviral infection, and he's going to attempt to propagate in high-throughput fashion um, each of the samples that we hand him. The supernatants from those samples will then be passed back to us for sequencing. And this slide is just to show um, this is one of several different uh, studies that Rick has done looking at virus susceptibility uh, to a variety of cell lines to identify which cell lines may be the best to perhaps cultivate uh, some of these enteroviruses that we may be able to capture in samples. I think the thing to note here is, is that different cell lines, there's looking at polioviruses and different enterovirus subsets. Um, all have different abilities to grow on different cell types uh, when they're inoculated at equal titers. And so we want to identify which cell lines work the best across many different virus types. So if you're looking at the metagenomic, metagenomic approach for Teddy, uh, this is captured in, in this panel. Basically, we're collecting, again, samples, extracting bacteria, enriching for the bacteria viruses uh, and eukaryotes. Um, extracting the, the DNA and RNA, and then pers pushing them through multiple pipelines, looking at the bacteria, uh, 16S and 18S from the eukaryotes, getting community structure information from that, who's there and their relative abundance, whole genome shotgun data to give us the pan genome uh, of each sample, that is the genes that are present, and then virus information from every single sample, and an independent whole genome shotgun sequencing run that will be done for each, uh, each sample that's that's analyzed. This is brand new data. This came off the press this morning, and and Suzanne doesn't know that we we're going to present this, so it wasn't this wasn't a, this is just a shameless plug from our end. Um, we extracted the first 96 samples, so the project was officially funded uh, just at the beginning of the year. It obviously, takes 
a little bit of time to get all the turrets pointed in one direction uh, to get going on such a project and, and robots tuned and so forth. But uh, through automation, as, as Suzanne mentioned, and using the PowerMag microbiome kit to capture RNA and DNA, um, we processed our first uh, 96 samples uh, for Teddy, and, and they look really good. And I should mention that as you're looking at this, uh, so this is a, a, a simple DNA gel uh, for each of the samples. The lightest samples on here are the controls, and the controls are uh, diluted. And so um, the samples that seem to be working the best uh, are indeed the, the Teddy samples. So we're very optimistic about uh, things going forward. How do you get this much data in, in a three-year period? Um, multiplexing. And, and so the idea, the, this slide gives you an idea of the various processes that each sample is going to see. So we have two main sample types, stool and plasma. There's 12,100 plus stool samples, and there's 5,976 plasma samples. Um, they're going to be multiplexed, as shown here, using barcoding. Um, and the Teddy epidemiologists um, have grouped samples by cases and controls so that all cases sample and all control samples for those cases are grouped together in each, uh, each, in most cases, lane. And if they can't all be squeezed into one lane in the same flow cell for each of the pipelines so that what little variability is introduced by the sequencing run uh, is removed because they're run together. We have controls, as you can imagine. Um, so thanks to, uh, so I've, I'm showing my graduate student, Matt Ross. He's not holding smoothies in the bottom. <laughs> uh, the, um, the controls that we use are to benchmark both the extraction methodology and the sequencing methodology. And for the Human Microbiome Project, we had similar controls. In this case, we call them generous donors. Um, we have two of them for Teddy uh, that we're using. Uh, and they've been homogenized, as I mentioned, and diluted to a point so that for every single extraction run, we are extracting from one of two, or from both, uh, generous donor samples for Teddy. Um, there's also a virus mock community that's been, um, that, that's been built into a commercially bought plasma sample, and, and so that's an a large volume that's also being distributed with all the plasma samples. They're shipped with all runs, they're blinded to us, uh, under most circumstances, and uh, and are pushed along the pipelines as well. So these will end up being the most sequenced stools in the history of man by the time all the runs are done. Um, we also run a blank with every single every single run. And we also introduce before sending out these generous donor samples to the Teddy repository so they could be shipped blindly. Um, we actually extracted uh, a large amount in bulk here in one extraction run so that we can differentiate any problems that arise, whether it occurred during extraction versus sequencing. And so, uh, but we do this by introducing this singularly prepped DNA into our pipeline after the extraction. And so, for example, if you looked at a data from the control, look at data from controls after a particular run, you see that there's a problem. Well, you can look at um, the data from multiple runs and identify whether it's the extracted sample or the sample that was extracted in mass outside of the Teddy project um, to isolate whether it was a sequencing problem or an extraction problem. I'm going to take a few moments to look at uh, our viral metagenomics pipeline just because it is a little bit different. Um, it's it's um, something that people that are specifically inter interested in viruses have been doing. Um, However, um, we wanted to make sure that we had enough sample to use to make sure that we not only are able to look at the microbiome, the bacterial component of the microbiome, but the viral component as well. And, and it sometimes gets overshadowed in a lot of microbiome talks. So with our viral metagenomics pipeline, we basically want to be able to identify viruses that are present uh, in a given sample and be able to differentiate between health and diseases, uh, disease states. We also use this pipeline, uh, I'm not going to talk about it here, but to identify etiologic agents. Uh, in samples where there's some, one to be sus suspected, but current diagnostics don't identify it. Um, we're trying these methods on low yield samples. We'll talk about that in a moment. And we're also relating the data, viral data, back to the bacterial and subject metadata to show a sort of a correlative analysis of, of how the viruses impact both the host and other, uh, other elements of the microbiome. So this sort of captures our problem. Um, 
Suzanne mentioned difficult samples earlier. Um, we find that clinical samples are different for a little bit different reason, not just because of the inhibitors that are present in a given sample, but just because they don't have a lot in them. And so whereas a lot of viral studies have looked at gallons and gallons of seawater or piles and piles of manure or waste treatment plants, uh, our samples look a lot like what's on the, shown on the right of this particular picture. And so how do you cap, when you're looking at viruses in those particular samples, especially hundreds or thousands of them, uh, the standard ultracentrifugation approaches to banding your viruses and extracting those using a needle uh, and syringe uh, is, is not feasible. And so Matt Ross, as I mentioned, reintroducing him and his samples, um, they're not his samples, the samples he's working with, um, helped us develop, develop this viral nucleic acid pipeline. We take a less is more approach, um, trying not to manipulate the sample too much because as everybody in the line knows, that the more you handle the sample, the less you'll end up with at the end. And so we've used a couple of filtration steps, remove, uh, destroy unprotected DNA, that is DNA outside of capsids, and then extract the nucleic acids that are found in capsids. And then we generate cDNA libraries for sequencing so that we capture the RNA and DNA that are present. We're developing a protocol that we've already evolved for 454 that uh, is now working on HiSeq uh, on the Illumina pipeline where we can in introduce Illumina adapters and barcodes without having the tra traditional uh, library method, without having to use the traditional library method of construction, um, thereby reducing costs and, and still enabling multiplexing. We can detect uh, RNA and DNA and retroviruses in samples, and so this, this is data. These are data from four healthy subjects from the Human Microbiome Project. Um, subjects are numbered across the top. You don't really have to pay too much attention to the platform and amount of sample. They were just parameters we were playing with at the time. Um, we identified virus, viruses um, or virus nucleic acids from each of these uh, individuals, and those that are highlighted with green boxes are found in each individual, and those in yellow boxes were found in one or two or three of the four individuals. Um, the virus families in black are DNA virus families, RNA is in red, and retroviruses are in green. should mention that on the left are some very key points. Um, viral databases are not as well curated as bacterial DNA bases, databases. Uh, we're getting there, but they're not there yet. Um, and so the hits need to be validated in a more rigorous fashion, and so these are things that we're following up on. Also, there are a lot of viruses that are just passing through. Uh, we find a lot of th viruses, virus signatures to things that we eat, such as tomato viruses or spinach viruses or um, bovine viruses. Um, and so um, that in itself suggests that we're getting viruses that aren't nat naturally colonizing humans, but uh, just may be present in the environment or the contents of what, what's been eaten. We also identify phage. The phage databases, thankfully, are, are better curated in, in such a way that the primary host is often identified with a phage that you're, you're looking at. So you can start to or more easily attach blooms of phage with decreases in the uh, bacteria that they allegedly infect. And, and so you start to get these coral of analyses built up uh, in phage and bacterial populations. When the, NIH, when the NIH started the Human Microbiome Project, one of the first comments made was they won't be able to tell their nose from their butts. And so um, as a benchmark threshold, we wanted to see if we can tell our nose from our butts in terms of our viral pipeline. And we can indeed in, in detect different types of viruses, uh, thankfully, uh, in our stool versus our nasal wash samples. Specifically with Teddy, we're obviously very interested in the enteroviruses. And so um, with the help of Rick Lloyd again in our department, we created a mock community of enteroviruses and PBMCs and then sequenced them to different depths on the Illumina pipeline and found that uh, using our methodologies, we're able to identify um, uh, sub-PFU levels of viruses in some samples using of some viruses. And so for the, for the virus families, we, uh, for enteroviruses, we used uh, five different enteroviruses um, and sequenced them, as shown here, to different depths. And based on the sequencing coverage, as you'd imagine, you can detect to different degrees of resolution. And so with about three gigabases of sequence, um, we were able to develop. To, we were able to see 0.1 PFU of Coxsackie B3, which is one of the big candidates for type 1 diabetes triggers. Um, however, as you noted, we're not going quite that deep in these particular samples, and so uh, we're going to be monitoring our sensitivity using the mock community samples uh, that I mentioned earlier 
throughout the pro pro uh, progress of this project. So I alluded to all the data that are being generated. I just want to take touch base in a moment on the analysis. Um, there may be some people on the line that are a little bit more attuned to microbiome studies, and so I, I didn't want to slight those individuals. For 16S and 18S, um, as mentioned, Rob Knight is our collaborator at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, on projects, even, even projects we don't collaborate with him on, we, we use uh, CHIME, the uh, analysis tools that uh, his group has, has done a great job of developing. Uh, this allows for alpha diversity, that is the richness and, in, and evenness uh, of, uh, of the members of single communities, um, and then allows you to compare those measures against multiple samples, hundreds if not thousands of, th of samples, giving you beta diversity analyses, um, and then al allows you to imply statistical weight or impart statistical weight on those data sets and analyses so that you can begin to identify which taxa indeed are associated with which uh, sample types. For the whole genome shotgun data sets, um, we're going to use a number of tools. Some of those uh, are present uh, in the Chime pipeline. Others developed by Curtis Huttenhauer at, the, at, at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, and these are specifically, without going into the nitty gritty of whole genome shotgun and next generation sequencing processing, um, Basically, we're, we're looking to trim data, assemble data, identify genes that are present using uh, existing databases, uh, and then use tools that Curtis and others have developed uh, and that others that are being developed here uh, to identify me metabolic networks that are present in each sample, compare them across samples, uh, identify taxa down to the strain level, uh, be able to identify polymorphisms that may be associated with communities, associated with disease, um, and and then also begin to build up the DNA component of the uh, viral metagenomic uh, arm of the study as well. And that's sort of the first level of analysis that will be done. Um, and then in terms of vi the viruses themselves, we use a similar starting path for the whole genome shotgun data. We trim, we assemble, uh, we compare it to known databases. Um, we uh, map to uh, viral families. Uh, to identify the families of viruses that are present and then begin looking at uh, the virus polymorphisms themselves, relate that to the metadata collected for type 1 diabetes onset, and then identify, hopefully, potential viruses associated with, with diabetes onset. And of course, the holy grail would be to identify a specific enterovirus that uh, perhaps genetically susceptible individuals are exposed to. Uh, and for which maybe a vaccine or therapeutic could be uh, used to intervene. As with any project, especially with contracted projects, there is a timeline. Um, and we're hoping to accomplish, all, we have to accomplish all of this in three years, and, and this is the way we plan to do it, both in the top half in terms of our um, each of the pipelines for data generation, and then the analysis shown on the bottom, of inverse, uh, the inverse complement to, to each other, data being generated full speed earlier and analysis wrapping up the full speed later as the data sets accumulate. Where are we going to put it all? That's a good question. Um, the, uh, fortunately, uh, the experiences of our group and the Human Genome Sequencing Center here at Baylor um, have, we have lots of experience in dealing with large data sets and the 42.7 terabytes of data that will be generated uh, is actually relatively small compared to most genomic projects that are, that are handled in the Genome Center here. The data will be deposited, uh, will be mirrored at the TED East site, uh, Data Coordination Center site, uh, so that the epidemiologists and statisticians there can work together with our group uh, and Rob's groups and others uh, in being able to deconvolute what all of this means in terms of disease onset. And with uh, the help of the Bioinformatics Research Laboratory here at Baylor, uh, who also serves as the epigenome DAC for the NIH, uh, Data Coordination Center for NIH, thereby giving them lots of expertise and lots of large-scale sequencing projects. Um, we'll be using this tool, uh, this tool and, and site to be able to not only um, create a repository for the data that are being generated, but also provide tools that uh, interested individuals could use to be able to deconvolute it in, uh, in ways that are more meaningful for their own research projects. And so with that, I'd like to, I, I would be remiss without thanking uh, the members of my ever-expanding group here at Baylor, um, members of our department here at Baylor College of Medicine, uh, including especially Rick Lloyd, who's the virologist that has collaborated with me on the Teddy Project, 
uh, the fantastic people at Teddy, uh, including Jeff Krischer and Kendra Obiak, um, and the members of the Infectious Disease Subcommittee, Nick Whitey and uh, Eric Tripp of the University of Florida. Genome Center at Baylor, as I mentioned, is integral for all of our metagenomic approaches, uh, metagenomic studies. Suzanne has been fantastic and be able to evolve protocols to our needs. And of course, we have many funding uh, agencies to thank as well for all this. So I'm not sure where we are at the time, but I thank you all for, for hanging in there with us. And I'll always take questions, whether it's here or through email or other contact later. Great. Thank you very much, Joe. What a project. That's a huge amount of data you're going to generate there, isn't it? Yes, thank you. And it's, we, were, we were even trying to think about how to put that together it must give you a headache. Yeah, it, it does. Because when you start thinking at the large level, then the little details pop up and you've got to remember those. Sure, absolutely. So Suzanne's mic is open as well. So um, she's just going to um, and get involved in this discussion. We'll just have uh, a few questions for mm -hmm. you. Um, so we'll just kick off with, um, so are the bacterial communities in the gut of the type 1 diabetes patients different from those in the rest of the population? Is that known? Yeah, so um, Eric uh, Triplett's group actually published a paper on this, um, I believe it was either last year or the year before, I think it was last year, um, with a very small uh, subset of the Teddy, Teddy subjects just to kind of get an idea of, of the answer to just that question. And indeed, there seemed to be um, some signatures that suggested that the bacteria uh, in type 1 diabetes in individuals uh, is is different. Um, and now the, the mission of the Teddy project is to define how different that is. Is it the same is it as different regardless of where you where you live, whether you're type 1 diabetic in the United States or if you're in Europe. Um, we also have other type 1 projects stemming from South America and other parts of the world too because we don't want, it's, it could be clearly um, one could hypothesize that a uh, Western diet, for example, may be responsible for some of sure. some of the effects too. And so, um, it's it's evidence right now suggests that it is. And statistically, we're going to build up the case to show just how much and how. Okay, so that kind of we've just had a question in from Jeff Leach, and he's asking, uh, yeah, what are the what? I understand the end point is the identification of a potential virus, but what about the lifestyle variables that are leading to the increase in type 1 in the first place. Yes. That's kind of what you're talking about there, yeah. Yes, yes, and, that, and that's a fantastic point, and, I, and it's, I don't even have, I wish I could have a, I don't have a slide that shows the scope of the Teddy um, program, but there are epidemiologists and dietitians and um, immunologists and uh, you name it, well obviously infectious disease experts, um, mm. that are slicing and dicing the data sets um, that are being collected from the diaries, from the data that are being generated. There's a metabolomics arm, there's a transcriptome arm for the host. Wow. Um, all those data are going to be layered on top of one another uh, somehow <laughs> in a way that uh, we'll hopefully be able to discern some of these other components as well. <laughs> wow. Okay. And uh, a question just in from Marin Olson. So have you seen variations between male and female diabetics, my microbiotica? Uh, we don't we don't know the answer to that yet, and so um, that will hopefully be some that should be something that falls out from these data sets. Uh, but that's a fantastic question. In healthy individuals, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between in, in gender uh, in the in the gut microbiome over larger groups of people, um, and so if there is a difference in male and female uh, the type one uh, subjects, uh, it would be of particular interest. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we have here. So, um, and can I can antibodies to any of the suspected viruses be found in type one diabetes patients? Yes, and so that's one of the things that's going to be examined uh, alongside uh, the studies that we're doing. So I think there's an autoantibody group and an immunology team that are looking at the antibody profiles in individuals with type one diabetes. Um, and, and this field is what led to the original discovery of the three autoantibodies that are associated with disease. Um, however, what's going to what will happen um, is we don't since we don't understand the we, since we don't know the virus, we clearly don't understand the mechanism by which viruses sure. cause or trigger type one diabetes. And so, if we're fortunate enough to be able to cultivate the virus itself alongside of identifying it by sequence homology, um, we'll be that much closer to being able to use those viruses. 
uh, or that virus uh, to probe the serum of individuals with type 1 diabetes to see if they have antibodies for it. Um, likewise, if it's not there, if we're not able to propagate the virus directly, we can use the sequences that we I, hopefully will identify uh, in, in those with type 1 diabetes to, to, to mine for those viruses and pull them out of samples uh, to be able to do those same types of studies. Cool. And so, so do you think it's likely that it will be one or a small set of viruses that act as triggers? Or? No, I, I try to keep an agnostic the out point because I feel like if I get too biased in one direction, I, yeah. you know, that'll, that'll start weighing in on things a little bit. Or I, I, I may have playful, uh, I may have designs on you know, biases that are introduced by collaborators. But in reality, you know, this enterovirus push is uh, is there's obviously some date, data and weight weight toward it uh, for type one diabetes. Fortunately, mm -hmm. our our uh, our pipelines are are also agnostic and. If there's any viruses that are there, we should be able to detect them that have uh, have an association. Um, if it's if it's one or a subset, we should we should see it if it's there in sufficient amounts. Um, that's the beauty of the pro this prospective study is that other studies to date look at samples that are collected either after or way after someone you know, or a disease onset. In our case, if it's a short-lived event, we should be able to see it leading up to uh, disease onset. Sure. And so, do you, do you think that a vaccine is a possibility then, or is that is that an end goal? Or that's that's if we if we allow ourselves to be um, have that holy grail uh, outlook, then yes, I think that is a I think that is a possibility. If we can identify a virus, then there's a definitive chance that we could identify that we could develop a vaccine for. Cool. Okay, and so let's just uh, switch track a little bit, and um, we have a few time for a few more questions. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the um, the purification, the the sample prep. So, so from a so you, you said that the, the the kit that you have from Mobile is essentially custom made. Did did you have any other options there um, without that kit? Are there any other options available? Well, so so yes and no. Um, so. Yes, in the fact that um, when we began the human microbiome project about 2006-2007, uh, uh, we scrutinized a number of kits uh, at the time um, from a variety of manufacturers uh, looking for something where we weren't automated at the time. We were using good old-fashioned technician hands, which are with seeding the robots here. Um, and we, wanted, we wanted kits that gave us good recovery, good yield, were easy to use and also gave us consistent results across a diverse number of body sites uh, and sample types. And so for the Human Microbiome Project, we looked at 18 samples of, uh, in females and 15 samples of males that were skin, oral, GI, and so forth. And the um, at the time, was mo the mobile power cell kit came out to be um, on top uh, in our experience. And so that was what was adopted for the Human Microbiome Project. For the um, for Teddy and our subsequent projects, um, obviously we had you know now evolved with our lab has evolved with mobile products, and so we were uh, well well customer well acclimated to their their products, which performed great for our needs. The um, uh, there are a couple of manufacturers that do produce um, DNA and RNA uh, isolation kits. Um, and, and that, that that seemed to work well as as well. Um, we just happened to uh, luck out and find that the power microbiome kit was coming to the market at the time when uh, we needed an automated answer and we needed recovery that gave us results that were comparable and benchmarkable against the HMP data sets, which became the gold standard for the community. And so, um, one of the known quantities in microbiome research is the fact that different sample preps will give you different answers depending on um, you know, how, how different they are. Um, and so we wanted to have results from the Teddy project that could be cross comparable to other studies in addition to just you know, their own samples. And so using the mobile power microbiome kit allows us to cross compare against uh, samples from HMP and from other studies that we've done here. Sure. Okay. Um, so I think we'll take one more question. We'll have a few more questions coming in, but what we'll do is uh, we'll email them to you, sure. and you can possibly uh, answer those offline. So um, 
the, the last question. In terms of safety, do you have to take any special precautions when working with stool samples like this, just from the eyes of a general lab worker? Yes, and so um, when we handle all samples, the general lab practice for BSL-2 human sample research is that all samples are treated as if they're contaminated um, mm -hmm. with something infectious. Um, and so samples are handled, you know, you take your typical clinical laboratory precautions, so gloves and, and eyewear and lab coats and uh, working in, uh, oftentimes working in uh, biosafety cabinets uh, to reduce sure. anesthetization and so forth. Okay. okay, I think we'll wind it up there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, for a, a fantastic presentation and some okay. great answers to those questions. And uh, thanks also to Mobile for sponsoring this webinar and for, um, for all the work they've done with um, us and with the Teddy project. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. Last, thank you. You're welcome, guys. And at last, but by means no least, a big thank you to our audience for taking the time to attend and listen to us today. If you've enjoyed the seminar and you would like to view the video recording of the session, please visit the seminars page on bitesizebio.com. It should be available there within the next 24 hours. And there you can also check out our upcoming webinars. So until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Bitesize Bio.